All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Custody Clinic presented by Legal Aid of North Carolina. While Legal Aid is unable to offer representation in most custody cases, this presentation will provide you with an overview of custody law in North Carolina and guidance on how to file a custody complaint on your own. The presentation will also address the impact of the COVID-19 emergency on filing for custody at this time. The presentation will explain custody law as it applies to both parents and non-parents. Our presenters today are attorneys Spencer Schold and Laura Easy. Spencer Schold is the owner of the law office of Spencer E. Schold, PLLC, and represents clients in family law and criminal matters. She is a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill and the University of Georgia School of Law. Spencer is also an intake attorney with Legal Aid's Helpline and is passionate about making the legal system accessible for all. Laura is a graduate of Wake Forest University and Wake Forest University School of Law. She is an intake attorney with Legal Aid of North Carolina. Prior, prior to joining Legal Aid of North Carolina, Laura worked in private practice focusing on family law matters. The presentation will take approximately 35 minutes. Following the presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask the attorneys general questions about the law. Please keep your questions as general as possible as we are unable to provide you with legal advice specific to the facts of your case. Thank you for attending today's clinic. And with that, I will turn it over to attorneys uh, Spencer and Laura. Thanks, Blaine. Thank you, Blaine. Good afternoon, guys. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to file a custody matter pro se on your own uh, in North Carolina. It's worth mentioning that um, along with this presentation, we will be updating with some COVID-19 matters that are impacting our courts across North Carolina. This includes um, district courts where custody matters are heard. Uh, the clerk of court is opened in each county for individuals to file lawsuits, but you should check with your local clerk of court to determine if there's any sort of limitations on hours where they're accepting the public to come file documents. Legal aid is open and fully operational. We've listed our website and also the helpline number 1-866-219-LANC, which is 5262. So as Blaine mentioned, um, this clinic is going to be providing you with some general information about filing a complaint for custody. Some disclaimers from the outset, legal aid does not represent you and will not be completing any of the forms that we discussed today and will not be attending any court hearing or trial. We are not making any guarantees that you will be gaining custody or visitation of a child that is subject of a complaint. Our goal today is just to provide assistance to pro se litigants that are initiating actions on their own. Things that you should keep in mind going forward. If your case involves things such as uh, you or the child is a victim of domestic violence, CPS is involved. If a child lives in a state that is not North Carolina or an opposing party is an active member of the military, then we advise that you consult with a private attorney as this may impact your case. Also, if there's already a custody matter pending in North Carolina or another state um, and there's an order in place, this presentation is not going to be very helpful for you. This is for cases where there's an initial filing that you are going to be starting on your own. Some terminology that you'll hear us using throughout the presentation, I'm gonna give some definitions on so that we can clarify that from the get-go. A plaintiff is a person who starts or initiates a legal action. Um, and this is the person who would be filing the complaint. The defendant is the person who receives the complaint or the party who's being sued. Pro se, it's a Latin phrase. It means for oneself. That means that a litigant is representing themselves in court without the assistance or representation of an attorney. There's legal custody and physical custody when we talk about child custody in general. Legal custody is the important decision-making authority regarding a child. So I like to refer to these as big ticket items, major decisions that parents will make or a party will make about a child's education, medical care, dental care, religious upbringing. Physical custody is where and with whom the child lives with. So where the child lives and how much time the child is spending with each party. You can have joint custody, sole custody, or primary custody or visitation. So joint custody, again, you could have joint legal custody, meaning two parties are sharing those big ticket decision-making items. 
You could have joint physical custody, meaning the parties are sharing time with a child. You could have sole legal custody, meaning one parent is the primary parent to make decisions about the child. You could have primary physical custody, meaning that a child is primarily living with one parent and then the other parent, the non-custodial parent might have visitation. And custodial schedules are gonna be determined on um, what's in the best interest of the child. They'll take, a judge will take into account ages of the children, how close parents live to each other, et cetera. And we'll go into that in more detail as we go along. You can have temporary custody or permanent custody. So temporary custody is a decision or an order that is entered by a court where there has not been a final determination on custody entirely. So it's entered without prejudice you would likely, there should be a reconvening time or a new trial date included in the order where you would go back for permanent custody. This means that the custody trial is not completed. It's not determined entirely. Temporary custody is easier to modify. Uh, generally, temporary custody orders are not appealable. And the standard that a judge applies in temporary custody matters is called the best interest of the child standard. Permanent custody, these kind of orders are appealable, um, but permanent doesn't truly mean permanent in the normal sense of the word. As long as a child is under the age of 18, child custody orders can be modified um, at any point in time upon a party filing a motion to modify. The trick with motion to modifies in permanent custody matters is that the best interest of the child standard is not the only standard that applies. The first hurdle that you'd have to overcome in modifying a permanent order is showing that there's been a substantial change in circumstance that affects the welfare of a child. So custody is governed by section 50 of the North Carolina General Statutes. We've, list, we've listed 50A and 50-13.1, and these speak to um, custody specifically. 13.1 uh, mentions mediation. If parties to a lawsuit are unable to reach an agreement at mediation, and Spencer will go into mediation a little bit later, then your case would be set for trial before a district court judge, and the judge will make a determination on legal and physical custody of a child. The judge will listen to the parties and the witnesses and consider any evidence that's presented at trial, and depending on um, who the parties in a custody lawsuit are depends what sort of standard the judge would apply. So like I mentioned before, if it's just the run of the mill custody action between a mother and a father, then the legal standard is gonna be the best interest of the child on an initial filing. And when I say um, parents, it could be biological or adopted. The um, second standard is if there's a non-parent involved and in suing for custody. In those situations, such as like a family member, a grandparent, a judge needs to apply a different standard there, a third party has to first show that there's a significant relationship or bond with the child that's at issue in the custody complaint. And then the third party would have to show that the judge that the parents either neglected or abused the child or had acted inconsistently with their protected status. And that inconsistent action could be something like um, a parent or parents leave a child with a third party for a long period of time and, and don't really have any sort of communication with their child. So who can sue? I mean, it could be a parent, a relative, like I mentioned, a grandparent, a person, an agency, organization, or an institution that's claiming a right to, to custody and relationship with a child. When can you file a case in North Carolina? Well, the child has to be a resident of the state of North Carolina for at least six months prior to filing an action. If a child is under the age of six months, the child has to have lived in North Carolina for the majority of his or her life. Once you've determined if North Carolina, North Carolina is the proper state to file a custody action, then you need to think about what district, where do I file this? What district court is appropriate here? And you can either file in the county where you reside or the county where the child and the other party resides. Before you file a lawsuit, you should think about what your goals are and if there's any drawbacks to filing. You don't need to file an action for child custody if you're looking to get child support, um, welfare assistance, school enrollment issues, medical insurance, or temporary child care. Like I mentioned, there could be some drawbacks to filing a lawsuit for child custody. The, there's a lot of paperwork. It's pretty time consuming. You could have multiple trips to the courtroom, courthouse. 
the court is going to examine your personal life, and that includes criminal backgrounds, your character, employment history, any mental health issues, if you're dating people, significant others, that's all going to come into question. Also, sometimes people file a lawsuit and the opposing party had been a disinterested party, someone that doesn't really come around frequently. And this might make an opposing party get involved suddenly. And lastly, there's no guarantees when you go to court because everything's in the judge's discretion. It's subjective. They're determining what's in the child's best interest. So you could get an order at the end of the day that might be disagreeable to your goals. I mentioned this pre-filing self-evaluation, thinking about what your goals are and some of the information that might come out about you. So things to think about is your current employment situation or prior employment situations. If you have any pending or past criminal charges, if you have a valid driver's license, what your living situation is like, if you have any issues with mental health and how you are addressing those, if there are any prior court orders that can include domestic violence um, or other criminal matters. And then lastly, are you seeking custody or are you just seeking visitation? So joint custody, what's your goal here? If you're seeking joint custody, that would be both parents sharing custody of a child, making major decisions. Sometimes joint custody could entail that um, a child primarily lives with one parent, but the other parent is still getting substantial time. Sole custody, one parent has custody here um, and is making the majority, if not all of the major decisions regarding the child. The child would live with one parent, the other parent or the other party could have some sort of contact or visitation. And visitation is when the non-custodial parent has a right to see the child. And again, the amount and um, type duration is gonna be dependent on the ages, how close the parents live to each other. And um, it's gonna be on a typical schedule, a usual schedule. So now that you've done all of that thinking about if you wanna file, if you're ready to file, get ready for paperwork. So the documents that we're going to be discussing today and how to fill out include the domestic civil action cover sheet, a civil summons, a complaint, the petition to sue as an indigent, which may not be applicable, but could be applicable in your case, the, and the civil uh, service members civil relief act affidavit. Most of these forms can be found at nccourts.org and we've provided a link in the PowerPoint. And I think that we also have a link to download um, this packet yourself from Legal Aid's website. And we include that link at the end of the presentation. And those of you who registered for the clinic via Zoom, I think also probably got that link sent to you. Um, but that is something that you can download from our, our website um, once, once you've seen how to fill out all the paperwork if you don't already have that. Um, this is Blaine. I just want to jump in real quick here, guys. Sorry. I, I will mention that at the moment, the Legal Aid website is down, but it will be coming back up. Thanks. Thank you. So when you're filling out the forms, um, if you could type them, that would be best because it'll be legible. Um, if you're handwriting them, please use blue or black ink and make sure that you're writing things as legible as possible. I suggest that you take the original as well as three copies of each form when you're going to the clerk's office for filing. And uh, we'll discuss how to file, where to file, and how to get the opposing party, the defendant, served once you've filed a lawsuit. So the first top or the first document we'll be discussing is the complaint for custody. It's designed to be pretty self-explanatory. You shouldn't leave any spaces blank unless you're sure that that space does not apply to you. And beware that this document needs to be signed in front of a notary public. So the top left of the document is gonna have a blank where you're gonna fill in the county. So you'll write the county where you're filing the lawsuit. You shouldn't put anything in the top right corner where it says file number because the clerk's gonna give you that number and place that on the document when you file. There will be a box plaintiff versus defendant. So under plaintiff, you're gonna type out your full or write out your full legal name for the defendant, same thing, putting in the full legal name of the defendant. Sometimes you could have two defendants in a lawsuit. That would be the case of like a third party custody action where a grandparent might be suing um, the biological parents of a child. So you would have grandma or grandpa versus mom and, and dad. So you'd have two defendants in that situation. Then you'll move down to the actual paragraphs of the complaint. The first paragraph is going to be the um, county where you live. So you would write in the county and state where you live. Number two, paragraph two, it's gonna be the county and state where the defendant lives. Paragraph three, you're gonna be selecting your relationship to the defendant. 
And then paragraph four, you're gonna fill out the names of all the children that are involved in the case and you should include their age and date of birth. If you need additional lines, you should add an extra page to the complaint. Number five on there talks about the affidavit as to status of the minor child. We'll get to that in the next coming slides. That needs to be completely filled out and signed in the presence of a notary and then attached to the complaint. But on the second page of the complaint, you're gonna find number six. Paragraph six, you're gonna select if there is or is not a child support action for any children that are subject to the action. So any of the kids that you listed on page one. Number seven and eight, you're gonna leave blank. As also, um, also number nine, you're gonna leave blank. For the prayer for relief, if you're seeking temporary custody and permanent custody, select temporary. If you're not seeking temporary, you can leave that, block, that box blank. You'll fill in the date, sign your name on the signature line, add in your mailing address and phone number, and be sure that that contact information is correct and up to date. And if it's not, or you move after filing, you should really update the clerk to any changes to your contact information. That's the only way that the court really can get in touch with you regarding mediation or changes to the court calendar, or if they're mailing orders to you, et cetera. The third page is that verification page. I mentioned that this document needs to be signed in the presence of a notary or a clerk of court. Notaries can be found at legal aid offices, at banks, sometimes at like a UPS or FedEx type store. Sometimes a clerk can serve as a notary, but that's not guaranteed. You may need to call the clerk of court ahead of time um, if you're planning on the clerk to verify your complaint to see if that's possible. Be sure when you go to get your complaint verified that you are bringing a valid photo ID such as a driver's license. As a precaution for COVID-19, you could wear glasses or some sort of makeshift face mask or gloves when you go to the courthouse for filing or getting your signature notarized. Um, you might wanna consider putting your ID in a plastic baggie like a Ziploc and discard after it just to try to keep you as safe as possible. Um, it's worth also noting that you may need to pay a small fee to a notary when they notarize your uh, signature and that will likely need to be in cash, particularly if you're at the courthouse. At the time of going to the notary or clerk to verify your signature, you can fill in the state and county at the top of the verification page. Then you would print your name on the first line, sign your name on the signature line, and then and the notary is gonna fill out the, the bottom portion of that form. The affidavit as to status of minor child you're gonna be filling out one affidavit per child. This document needs to be notarized and you need to indicate on the form whether there is any other custody proceeding going on that you're aware of. So this could include DVPOs, TPRs, out-of-state custody actions. TPRs are um, termination of parental rights. So in order to fill out one of the affidavits for the minor child, you are going to, again, fill out the top left corner where you're listing the county where you're filing it, leave the court file number blank, add in your name and address and the defendant's name and address in the boxes on the right-hand side underneath the, the title affidavit as the status of minor. You're gonna list the minor child's full name, add their date of birth and their birthplace. Then once you've completed that, you're gonna move down and this is where it can get a little time consuming. So you're going to need to list all of the addresses and who the child has lived, lived with for the past five years, starting with the most recent and then going back five years. So you'll fill out um, the, the periods of residence over the last five years, the address where the child has lived, the names of the individuals the child has lived with, and then the current address of the person. Down below, it says, I further state that you either have or have not participated in litigation concerning custody of the above named child. So if you have, you're gonna select that box. What was your capacity as the participant? Were you a party, a defendant, a plaintiff? The date of the, de the determination, the court number, um, details about the case. This would be, you could indicate whether it was a DVPO, if it was a termination of parental rights, if it was a paternity lawsuit, and then the name and the address of the court. If you have any information about a custody proceeding um, where there might, excuse me, um, of a custody proceeding that's currently pending or previously was pending, such as a DV action, 
um, or a termination of parental rights or an adoption, you're going to list the court and then the details of that case. Again, listing the case number, describe the nature of the proceeding. Below from that, there's another box. If you know of any other people who has physical custody or claims to have custody or visitation to the child, you're gonna list the names and address of the people or person, and then select on the right-hand side, whether you believe that that person has claims to physical custody, claimed custody, or visitation rights. You should not sign this document until you're in the presence of a notary. You would date it, sign it, print your name, write your relationship to the child that is at issue of the affidavit. And then on the left-hand sign under sworn, affirmed, and subscribe before me, that's where the, the notary or the clerk would fill out that document. So the petition to sue as an indigent may not be applicable in your case, but it could be. It, you are required to pay a filing fee unless you're approved for free filing by the clerk. And the way to get approved is submitting this petition. You would fill out the petition um, and add the county name in the top left corner. Leave um, the file number blank because you don't know that yet. You should select district under what court you're in. We're in district court because this is a family law matter. And then this is a custody action and it's an initial filing. So you would be selecting the, the petition to assert claims, which is the first box. The next set of boxes down below is asking um, if you receive any sort of food stamps, AFDC, SSI. So any and all benefits that you receive, you should select those boxes. Check any and all and be sure to include that. If you are not represented by any legal service organization and you are filing this document pro se, don't check the box indicating that you are represented because you're not. If you don't receive any forms of assistance, but you believe that you are not financially able to pay the filing fee, you can select the last box on the petition. If your income's low enough, you can ask the clerk to approve your peti petition to sue as an indigent. You might need to, in to complete an additional affidavit that states what your income is and what your living expenses are. You would have to sign this document before a notary public or clerk of court and swear and affirm that the information you're submitting is true. So be mindful that you could be held in contempt of court for giving false information on this form. So provide all relevant information and tell the truth. You would be and, signing. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say just as a heads up, um, so then you know what the fee is. Statewide, the filing fee for a custody action is $150. There are also fees later on for whenever you wanna set the, the case for hearing in front of a judge. So anytime that you're requesting basically court time in front of a judge, you would have to file a notice of hearing and that's an additional $20. So filling out one of these petitions up front and being approved as indigent means that you wouldn't have to pay that $150 initial, initial filing fee Plus, you don't have to, every time there's a new fee, fill one of these out. It would just stay in the file, um, and then you wouldn't have to pay those, those later on fees that come up either. Exactly. So um, if you're not approved and you do have to pay, be sure that you're bringing cash to pay the filing fees. Um, the clerk is not going to accept personal checks. And then we have the civil summons. So this is the document that's served on the defendant along with the complaint. And I sort of refer to the civil summons sort of as like the heartbeat to your lawsuit. You have to have a valid summons for your action to be proper. Again, you're gonna fill in the county on the top left corner, select district court, cause that's the court we're in, leave the file number blank. That's gonna be assigned by the clerk. Add in your name, just like you did on the complaint. Add in the defendant's name, just like you did on the complaint. And then you're going to put the defendant's address on um, on the document, and you might have more than one defendant, but you're going to add the address um, of each defendant in each of the box. So defendant one is on the left side, defendant two is on or defendant two is on the right side. In the box um, stating that the name or address of the plaintiff or plaintiff's attorney, you would write your name on the complaint. Uh, as you did on the complaint, include your, your address and contact information, leave everything else blank, that's gonna be completed by the clerk. And then the last slide that I have for you today before Spencer takes over is um, the domestic civil action cover sheet. So this form is required by many courts. Uh, you'd fill it out if requested by the clerk and you would complete the, um, 
the form with the errors as indicated on here, again, filling out the county, leave the file number blank. If, um, if you're filing it initially with the clerk, then the clerk's gonna give you that number. It's gonna be an initial filing. So select the box under where it says domestic civil action cover sheet on the right hand side. You're gonna select initial filing. You would include your name and address as well as the opposing party's name and address in those boxes. And then under defendant one, uh, you would select that there's a summons submitted. So yes, there is one. You would then also include um, that you are so filing in the type of pleading a complaint, which would be like the fourth uh, box on the left at the bottom. And then the claims for relief, it might be custody or it might be just visitation. So make sure you're selecting custody or visitation. You're going to sign this document, date it. And again, um, I would suggest having four copies, one original and three copies of this document as well. All right, so once you've filled out all those forms, as if you haven't uh, gotten your fill of filling out forms yet, um, this is the custody mediation cover sheet. So the purpose of this document is for the mediation office to be able to have information about the case, assign a mediation orientation date, as well as a mediation session date in each case. Um, this form can also tell the family court office as well as the mediation office if anybody in the case needs an interpreter. So there is a box on here, um, it's number four that asks, do either of the parties need an interpreter? If either the plaintiff or the defendant needs an interpreter, then one can be provided and it will be at the state's expense. Um, you can learn more about the North Carolina Courts Language Access Policy at the website that we've included on um, the presentation here. But just know that if you have a witness or you wanna bring somebody to court who speaks another language, the state may not, um, the state may not uh, supply an interpreter for that person because it has to be someone who's actually a party to the lawsuit. So really it's just gotta be the plaintiff or the defendant. So if you have a really, um, a really necessary witness who speaks another language, you might have to make some, some other arrangements to have that person have an interpreter there. Um, but you'll fill out all the, the information on the sheet for the mediation office. So then they have all of your updated info um, they might use this information to contact you to give you notice about, um, about important dates. So make sure that you give them information where you can actually be reached. Um, this is another required document that you have to complete when you submit your initial complaint. In short, this form is called the SCRA, which stands for the Service Members Civil Relief Act. So this is an affidavit, which an affidavit is just a document that means that you swear to the truth of the document in front of a notary when you, do, when you sign it. So all these documents that we've been referring to as affidavits, it just means that it has to be signed in front of a notary. So the purpose of this document is for you to tell the judge or tell the court whether the opposing party is in active military service. If your defendant is in active military service, there are special timing rules and notice rules that apply to your case. So if that does, if that is you, if, you're, if you know your opposing party is overseas or in active service, you probably want to speak to a private attorney so then they can um, explain those, those special rules to you more. I don't think that it, it, it's not all that common, um, but if you live in an area, you know, maybe near Fort Bragg or something where in those counties that this is gonna be a lot more common. So if you're in one of those areas where there's a high military population, private attorneys there are gonna be really used to filling out these documents. Um, there is also a publicly available website hosted by the Department of Defense. And I know this document is pretty tiny, um, but if you look at number two of the middle section there, um, the, the not number, but letter A, actually has the website in there that you would want to go to. And you can actually run a, a check that will immediately return you a result that tells you whether or not your opposing party is in active service or if they have been. So that's through the Department of Defense website. Um, there are a few other websites out there that try and charge people up to $30 to run one of these checks. If you're on a website that's trying to charge you money to run one of these checks, you're on the wrong site and don't pay the money. So make sure that you're using the website that's listed here on the form. You do have to create a login, um, 
but the benefit is just that you get to run this check for free. You do have to have some information about the other party. Uh, it helps if you have their social, but you at least need their full name and their date of birth to be able to run uh, a valid check. So, and if you have a middle name, then that's also really helpful. And try, if the person has, um, the person has a name that could have different spelling, you might want to run multiple checks just to make sure that you've, you've put in, you know, whatever last name they sometimes go by, or maybe they got married and it changed. So depending on, on your opposing party's name, you might want to run multiple checks just to make it absolutely clear this person's not in the military. Otherwise, your case may not be able to proceed as quickly. All right, so now that you are done with all of that tedious paperwork, it is actually time to file your case. So how do you get all of these papers that you just filled out filed? Well, like Laura said earlier, you, want, you really want four full sets of all these documents. So you want your originals and then at least three copies. You'll see why as we get more into talking about where all of these copies go, but it never hurts to have too many copies. And if you, if you show up at the courthouse and you realize that you don't have enough, some clerk's offices are going to charge you to make more copies there the day of court. So, or the day that you're trying to file these things in the courthouse. So just show up with more copies than you think you need. That's, that's the, the better rule of thumb. So you will physically take all of the papers that you just filled out to the courthouse. Um, nowadays, because of COVID-19, people are sending in documents rather than taking them in in person. Um, like Laura said at the beginning, some clerk of court's offices are operating on limited hours. So they're only open to the public for, you know, maybe a small window of time in the beginning of the day. Um, I think that the, the better practice right now to both protect yourself and the courthouse staff is to just send in documents, uh, especially because no, no custody cases are being heard right now. They're all being pushed beyond June the 1st. So you can certainly still go ahead and file. Um, but you're not going to get a court date before June the 1st right now. So it doesn't, it doesn't hurt if it's going to take a couple extra days to get there through snail mail. Um, if you do mail in your documents, make sure to include a um, prepaid return envelope in whatever document or in whatever package you send to the clerk's office. That way they can send you all the file stamped copies that are going to be yours back in the mail. So you physically walk into the courthouse or you mail the documents in. The clerk will file stamp everything, assign a case number to your case, they'll fill out the summons, and that's what you'll then need to take or again send in to the sheriff's office to, to have it served. There is a fee for having um, the uh, opposing party served, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, um, but for both the, the sheriff's service fee as well as the fee for filing your complaint if you don't qualify as indigent, um, make sure you have cash or a money order. They, they will not accept personal checks. So another thing to be aware of when you're taking all these papers into the clerk's office, um, you may wanna ask them how are dates assigned in my case. Some counties require that the parties themselves be the ones that request court dates. So if that's on you, you need to know. Otherwise you're, you, know, you might have filed this great lawsuit but if it never makes it onto a court calendar, it's not really doing you any good. So you need to make sure to stay in contact with the clerk's office about your court dates and, and whether they set them automatically or whether you need to request them. If you do need to request court dates yourself, you'll need to fill out a notice of hearing and the clerk's office should be able to, to direct you to the correct form because these can vary from county to county. Um, if you do have to fill out a notice of hearing, make sure that you, sent, that you send one to the defendant um, to show that they've been served with notice of the, the hearing. So how do you serve the defendant with the initial complaint? I think one of the biggest issues that comes up in this area is, you know, you want to file the lawsuit, but you don't actually have a good address for where the other party can be found. In that case, I would suggest you just do the best social media sleuthing that you possibly can. Um, you know, ask friends and family, see if you, if you know where they work, ask around. Um, but it's, it's pretty surprising how much information about themselves that people will post just on Facebook or Instagram or whatever other social media that people are using. So um, you might be able to find some good information about where someone can be served just by, by do, basically by being your own pri private investigator. Because ideally, if you don't know where the person can be served, you could hire a private investigator to look into that for you, but that can be pretty expensive. So 
um, we're all about trying to teach people how to do things on their own. So, um, so just so see what you can dig up. Um, if you have multiple addresses where someone might be able to be served, tell the sheriff that and give them a couple different places. Tell them where they work, not just where they live, if you think they're not really home or they're not gonna answer. Um, so you, you can get creative with that. The most common service fee for service by a sheriff's office is $30. And this can be cash or money order made out to the sheriff's department in the county where the defendant lives. So this can get tricky. Let's say that you live in Wake, but your opposing party, your defendant, um, maybe they live in Mecklenburg. So Wake County is not going to serve your defendant who lives in Mecklenburg County. So you're going to actually have to get in touch with the Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Office to get them to serve the defendant there. So um, so that, that piece of it is on you. You can't just assume that the sheriff's offices are going to cooperate and get it done because more often than not, that doesn't happen, unfortunately. Um, so just know that if you're dealing with, with different counties, you're, you're going to have to take that extra step. Um, this, the form that is pictured on this slide is the second page of the summons. So you fill out that first page of the civil summons, the, the document that Laura referred to as basically the heartbeat of your case. The reason why it's such an important part of your case is that this is your proof that the other person got served. And so that way, if the person doesn't show up to court, as long as they've been served, you can still proceed with your case. So this is the second page of that form. And if you go with um, the sheriff's office to do service, the sheriff's office will complete this form showing that the defendant was served and when and how, and, um, and then you'll have proof of service in the file. So that's if you're going through the sheriff's office. Another way that you can do or get valid service of your initial complaint is through USPS certified mail. So this can, you can, you can try the sheriff first. If that doesn't work, you can try certified mail or vice, vice versa. You can do whatever, um, whatever you think is, is gonna be the most effective and the most cost effective for you. Um, certified mail typically costs maybe between 12 and $20. Um, you can take the, the whole packet, the big set of copies, once they've been file stamped, take that to the post office, um, and then they'll have you fill out a little green card. It's basically the size of an index card, so, so maybe like about that big, um, and it's got the, the person's name on it and basically then a return address for you. So once the other person has been served, once they've received the, the, the documents that you mailed them, they actually have to sign it like a, like a receipt and then that receipt gets sent back to you. And then you would complete this form, um, which is an affidavit of service by certified mail. So this document tells the court, hey, I got the opposing party served. Oops, sorry, <laughs> um, sneak peek there. But that this document tells the court that you got the opposing party served um, and you would also include a copy, if not the original of that return receipt. So that way it would be in the file and you can move forward with your case. Make sure to keep a copy for yourself of everything that you file. And this also is because this is an affidavit, this is another one of those documents that has to be signed in front of a notary. All right, so you've done all the heavy lifting, you filled out all those forms, you got the person served, now what happens? So after the person's been served, they have 30 days to file an answer. That uh, 30 days can be extended for up to 60 days. If the defendant files a motion to uh, if a motion for extension of time to file an answer, that's ask that's the opposing party can ask the, the clerk to give them an additional 30 days. So it takes it from just the, the default 30 that you already get. It adds another 30 on top of that. So they, they might get up to 60 days from the day they are served to file an answer. So this is important. It's not 60 days from the day that you filed your case. It's 60 days from the day that they are served. So um, sometimes the way that court cases are set, it's possible you might actually have a court date set before the person has even filed their answer, especially if they have now this full 60 days. Um, the defendant can also, when they file an answer, they can include counterclaims. So maybe they want to counterclaim for child's, um, child support um, or there's a, you know, there's a few other related things that they could include that are family law related things you can put in a counterclaim. 
Um, but if any of those other things, because I'm not even going to say the words, <laughs> but because I don't want to confuse anybody. But if there's anything else in that answer or counterclaim other than custody, you need to consult an attorney ASAP. There are a lot of really important property rights that might be included as counterclaims in some of these cases that if you don't reply to, you might actually be waiving some very important rights. This is mainly the case where you and the other person were married. So if y'all were just dating, it's not very likely you're gonna see some of these, some of these um, property counterclaims. Um, but again, if you see anything in there other than custody, you need to take those papers to an attorney and ask, um, and ask how they how they affect the case and how they affect your legal rights. So um, one of the other really big things that happens very soon after you file, if not in some counties, the day that you file, you will be assigned mediation orientation and mediation session dates. If you're not provided those on the spot when you file your case at the courthouse or when you receive these documents back to you in the mail from the clerk of court, then the mediation office will actually mail notice of the dates to you and the opposing party. So that's why it's so important that on that mediation cover sheet that you provide contact information where you actually can be reached because you don't want to miss these dates. Otherwise, your, can't, your case may not be able to move forward. And if you don't show up to mediation orientation or the actual mediation session, it is possible you could be held in contempt of court. So just make sure that you keep up with these. Also, Spencer, just um, for COVID updates, um, going back one slide, the um, Supreme Court of North Carolina, Justice Beasley, uh, extended the uh, deadlines to respond to pleadings until June 1st, I believe. Right, yeah, that is true. Even if you filed a complaint tomorrow and the uh, opposing party was served the very next day, uh, they wouldn't have 30 days to respond just right now because of COVID and and uh, Justice Beasley's order extending deadlines to file responsive pleadings to June 1. That is true, yeah. So and, like if, let's say that the person was served today, then they would have a month. So, I mean, 30 days, I'm just not gonna do the exact math, but let's say it was May 14th. Well, they don't even need to file this motion for extension. They're just automatically already going to get up until June the 1st. That's how it shakes out. And then another thing to keep in mind, I've seen some counties implementing um, mediation using Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think especially um, orientation is being delivered that way. Mediation orientation is um, not the most exciting day trip to court, um, but it's very important. It, it, you sit down with a room full of other people that are also going through custody cases and you basically watch a video uh, and then they sometimes have people answer questions about what to expect in mediation. They tell you to block out about three hours of your day for mediation orientation. And the mediation session itself can be anywhere from three hours up until all day long, possibly, um, uh, you know, as long as you guys are working towards a resolution. So that's a good segue into what is mediation. So this clip here, and I could have included the link to the video, but this clip here is actually from a legal aid video that is available on YouTube. Um, and it talks about child custody in North Carolina. It's a little bit old, so some of the um, some of the law may not be, or procedures may not be quite as up to date as the forms that we've included in this presentation for y'all. Um, but I think it's kind of helpful to have a visual about what, you know, what to expect. So mediation is literally you and the other party plus a third party who's neutral, sitting in the same room, trying to come to a mutual agreement about parenting for the children. So y'all could come to an agreement about what custody is gonna look like, who's gonna get primary, you know, how legal custody is gonna, is gonna work. Is it gonna be one person making all the decisions or is it gonna be joint legal custody? And if you guys are able to come to an agreement, the mediator actually writes out what's called a parenting agreement y'all both sign it and then the judge signs off on it. When the judge signs off on it, it becomes a binding court order and you have to follow it. If you don't follow it, you could be held in contempt. Um, but you know, sometimes people just can't agree and sometimes mediation doesn't work. Sometimes it fails or sometimes people will say that mediation resulted in an impasse. So uh, it's I-M-P-A-S-S-E. So if you say that mediation impasse means Nope, we just, we reached a roadblock, we couldn't move forward and it didn't work. 
If that's the case, then you need to start thinking about the next steps. So you need to start thinking about preparing your case for a hearing in front of a judge. So we've got some tips for you for both preparing for trial and the day of. So preparing for trial, think about any witnesses you might have who can talk about how you're a good parent. Um, bring some evidence with you, gather some evidence that supports your claim as, as to why you're providing the best home for the child. You can bring in pictures maybe of the child's bedroom. Maybe you've got a great play set in the backyard that the kid likes to play on. Um, or, you know, like a, a community park just down the street that, that the child likes to play out with their friends. Um, school records, medical records. If you were really um, involved in getting an IEP for your child at school, then, then that can be something really good to bring in. If the other parent has any criminal convictions that you think are gonna be relevant that you wanna talk about, you can go to the criminal division in the courthouse and get a certified copy of their criminal record. That way it can actually come in as evidence during your trial and you can show that record to the judge. Um, also, another thing I think is very helpful to do ahead of time is to make a list of what you want the judge to know. And that way, as you're going through your trial, you make sure that you're not forgetting to say something important. And similarly, you can write an outline of your testimony and an opening and closing statement. An opening statement is just generally, what do you want the judge to know about your case? And then a closing statement is your chance to tell the judge, here's what I want and here's what I, I Think is in the best interest of my child and, and why you should do that. So on the day of trial, it's very important to dress conservatively. Wear professional attire, don't wear ripped jeans, don't wear shorts if you can help it. Button down or a collar shirt is great for women, you know, a blouse or um, a, nice, a nice shirt like you would wear to church. That's pretty standard. Um, it probably goes without saying, but be on time and do not arrive under the influence. Judges have the authority to right there on the spot order you to submit to a drug test. If they think that either of the parties is under the influence, they can make you leave the courtroom and submit to a urine analysis with a probation officer. So if you don't want that to happen. I mean, that could really affect your case very negatively and you could be held in contempt and, and held in jail the day of court. So obviously that can really negatively impact your case. So just don't even go there. Um, always tell the truth try and maintain a calm and, and professional demeanor, um, be respectful to the judge, try not to let the other party uh, rattle you because sometimes they will try and provoke you and make you angry while you're testifying. So um, just, just try and maintain your calm as much as you can. Also make sure that when you're having your trial, just stay focused on, on the issue of what's in the best interest of your child. Don't get tempted into talking about why the relationship with the other party didn't work out, why you guys can never get along. The, the judge doesn't wanna hear about that. The judge wants to hear about this child or these children and what's best for them. So after the trial is over, the judge can actually make a decision right there in court. So once the hearing is done, the judge might say, all right, here's my decision. Um, we talked about how orders can be temporary or permanent. That is in the discretion of the judge. Um, you can also modify orders later on if you're unhappy with it. It is harder to modify a permanent order though, just as a heads up. Um, and sometimes it can be tough to tell whether your order is temporary or permanent. Some judges try and make it a little bit easier by actually calling the document a temporary order or a permanent order. Um, but there are ways that temporary orders can just over time kind of um, now then be treated as permanent orders. So if you got a temporary order and it's been a long time since you got it, it's very likely that's going to be interpreted as a permanent order. So you might be up against that higher standard if you did want to modify it. So if you don't know, or you know, if you're unhappy with the outcome of your case, you probably want to start with just talking to an attorney about what your next steps are and what you can do. So very briefly, I want to talk about emergency custody because this is an issue, this is an issue that we hear about a lot um, through the Legal Aid Helpline. And I think it's something that's coming up more to uh, in the context of coronavirus and COVID. Um, so emergency custody is a temporary custody order that can be entered if the court finds that either the child is exposed to a substantial risk of bodily injury or sexual abuse, or there's a substantial risk that the child is going to be abducted or removed from North Carolina. This is a really high standard, just as a heads up. It can't just be, I think that, that she's gonna leave the state with my kid and, and so I need to do this emergency order. 
that's probably not going to cut it. You have to actually show that the risk of harm that you're alleging, either bodily injury, sexual assault, or the child being uh, abducted or removed from the state, you have to show that the risk that that is going to happen is immediate, not just, again, I think that this is going to happen. So if you've got, you know, if, if, if you have text messages from the opposing party saying that I'm going to snatch Johnny and leave the state and you're never going to see him again, that's pretty helpful. You want to probably include that screenshot with a motion for emergency custody. Um, if you're successful and if you get an emergency custody order, the court has to schedule a hearing typically within 10 days where you guys will both have a chance to be present and then the judge will make a somewhat more long-term decision about whether there should be another um, temporary order entered, which can be called a temporary emergency order. Sometimes they're called status quo orders, but regardless, the outcome tip at, from that 10-day hearing is typically that there's some other type of temporary custody order entered um, based on whether or not the judge finds that there actually is an emergency or an ongoing reason to have this, this order in place. So how do you file for emergency custody? Well, it's very important to know that most counties do not have their own forms for how you can do this. The form that we've included on this slide is actually specific to Durham County only. That said, I think that you can probably use this form as just kind of a go by or, you know, um, at least an example, if you're, if you're having to draft your own motion for emergency custody, this at least gives you a somewhat of a starting point. Um, some, uh, some counties will, will need their own forms or cover sheets to be filled out. So make sure that you're asking the, your, your local clerk of courts office or family court office if they have any other forms that you have to fill out. Along with your motion for emergency custody, you can include affidavits. Again, those sworn statements from people like therapists, maybe if DSS is involved and there's a caseworker with some, some helpful information, um, law enforcement, if, if, if that's something that's going on in your case, and maybe teachers. Um, I think particularly caseworkers and teachers sometimes have um, important information from seeing the children or working with them that if they're willing to, to fill out an affidavit for you to submit with your motion, that can be helpful. So, when you need to, or when you want to file for emergency custody, um, you need to take the motion completed to the courthouse ASAP. Don't say, okay, on Sunday, I think there's an emergency, but I'm going to get around to filing it Friday. I mean, that really weakens your case. If you think it's an emergency, you need to treat it like an emergency and act very quickly. Otherwise, that might hurt your case and, and the judge may not be convinced that it actually is an emergency if you didn't treat it like one. Most often the judge will give you a decision on your motion and grant or deny your request for the order the day that you submit it. So um, the, it happens very quickly, obviously, because it's an emergency. So again, you can use this form as a go by. If you're in Durham County, it's pretty lucky. You actually get to use this in Durham. Um, but if you're not in Durham, you can at least look at it so you know kind of what, what kind of information needs to be included. So very relevant and lots of questions about this going on these days. Um, COVID-19, coronavirus, and custody. So uh, right now, as most people know, we've got a stay-at-home order in effect. That's why Laura and I are broadcasting straight to you from our home. Um, but North Carolina's stay-at-home order was effective as of March 30th, and it runs through the end of this month, or I think through April the 29th. Um, we don't know yet whether or not that's going to be extended. But we do know that that stay at home order specifically allows for people to travel back and forth between their homes for purposes of custody exchanges or visitation. This, this, uh, this applies even if you don't just have a custody order. So if you and the opposing party are able to get along voluntarily without an order in place and you're still exchanging the child, um, then, then you can still do that. You're not, you're not going to get pulled over by law enforcement or ticketed. Um, if you're if you're actually taking a child to and from custody exchanges, um, you just obviously want to tell the, the officer that if you did get pulled over, um, and if you have a custody order, then you'd want to probably pull that out and show the order or show show the law law enforcement that you do have uh, a custody order. Um, like we said earlier, no custody cases are being heard until after June the first, and that's because of all these courthouse delays only emergency custody and domestic violence cases may be heard before June the 1st. 
Um, if you already have a custody order, you can agree to temporarily do things outside of the order. You know, you can agree to these informal arrangements where, yeah, the order says this, but we both agree in writing to do it a little bit different right now, maybe to reduce the risk that there's going to be transmission of the virus between your households. If you do that, then just be aware that the parent who doesn't have the child the majority of the time is probably going to be entitled to receive some type of makeup time later on. Even if you're doing things like video calls and that sort of thing, they should get some type of physical custodial makeup time later. Um, and then if you do have any type of court order in place right now, just know that disobeying that order or denying visitation, it could result in contempt of court. So if you're doing this and, the, and you guys aren't in agreement about it, then the other party might be able to file a motion for contempt against you. So just a couple more heads ups about how coronavirus is affecting uh, just general court operations right now. So like we said, clerk's offices are operating on reduced hours. Um, every courthouse in the state is posting notices at the door that say these, um, that say these next points on them. So if you've been in contact with anyone who tested positive, don't come in. If you traveled internationally in the last two weeks, don't come in. So lots of things. If any of these apply to you, you should take advantage of mailing things in as much as possible if you have to submit any documents right now. I think right now is probably a better time to just be working on all that paperwork, making sure it's all in order, get, getting everything together, because unless you do have an emergency situation, there's not really a huge rush to go ahead and file things right now since you're not gonna get a court date before June the 1st. Um, if you do have to go into the courthouse, so if you are filing one of these emergency motions, then use your best efforts to maintain good hygiene, wash your hands, take hand sanitizer if you have it, wear a mask, and also stay at least six feet away from other people in the courthouse. And um, that is all we have for y'all today. Uh, we've included the link for where you can download the self-help packet once Legal Aid's website is back up and running. Um, you can also just Google Legal Aid of North Carolina. Um, I think it's custody self-help. And the very first link that pops up um, will be the link to where you can download the packet. So I guess this is the point where we can now open it up and take some questions, right Blaine? Yeah, and we've actually got quite a few questions that have been posted uh, in the chat on Facebook, so we're, we'll go through those. Okay, cool. Um, this might take a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, yeah, bear with us, folks. There's a lot of questions. We'll get to your questions, I promise. All right, so I have my rights taken away by CPS. Can I get my custody back by using the info from this webinar? So first of all, just to reemphasize, we're not going to be able to give specific advice um, about the facts of your case without knowing any of the facts of why your custody was taken away or, or what's going on now. There's absolutely no way that we'd be able to advise you about that. Um, if you do need advice about that, you can contact the Legal Aid Helpline or you can seek an, um, an attorney in private practice. Um, we often refer people to the Lawyer Referral Service Hotline, that's through the North Carolina Bar Association. Uh, they have private attorneys who will do a 30-minute consult for $50, and that would be a really good candidate for that type of question, because that is very specific. Unfortunately, we can, just can't answer that in today's clinic. Okay, and we're going to have a few of those folks. I'm sorry, as, as they mentioned, we can only answer very general questions. So there's going to be some of these that we're not going to be able to answer. Um, we've had a, several requests to have the slides, the PowerPoint slides sent out after the video. Is that something that we can do? Yeah, I feel yeah, like definitely. Yeah. Okay, if you signed up on Eventbrite, uh, then we've got your email address and we will send out a copy of the PowerPoint to everyone following uh, the presentation. Uh, the video is also recorded and is available on our Facebook page. So you can go back and, and watch it there later. Um, let's see, do you still have to do mediation if both parties are in agreement on everything? We're just trying to get custody done in writing and have it legal, we're splitting the fee too. I think it would be beneficial to go to the mediation because then the mediator could draft up the parenting agreement that then gets sent to the judge for entry of it to become an order. Um, so yes, you should still go to mediation. You'll be ordered to attend anyway, unless you've hired a private attorney to draft a consent order 
um, for you and your opposing party signs it and submits it, then you would have to attend mediation and the mediator could assist with drafting. Yeah, I agree. I think you, I, I mean, maybe this, maybe this phrasing sounds bad, but you can use the parenting or you can use the mediator basically as, as your drafter for this order. Like Laura said, unless you've paid a private attorney to draft this for you, um, somebody's got to do it. And it's probably not going to be the judge unless y'all actually have a full on trial and neither has an attorney. So take every advantage of, of the mediator's office or the mediator being the one who comes up with a parenting agreement, just sign off on it. All right. Uh, for COVID-19 and not being on good terms, is it okay to refuse visitation with the other party to reduce exposure? Well, if you have a court order and you're refusing or denying visitation and the other party doesn't agree, then not following your court order can, can put you at risk of being held in contempt of court. Now, obviously, we don't know all the facts of what's going on in your case. I don't know if either of y'all are particularly high risk individuals, but just generally speaking, if you guys are not in agreement about doing something differently than what it says in your custody order, even though we're in the middle of a global pandemic and it seems kind of crazy, um, that is something that you could be held in contempt for because you're not following the order. So that, that is a little tricky. Okay, uh, what is proceeding at no cost called? Um, if you're referring to how do you proceed without file or without paying any of the filing fees, that's um, the, the petition to file is indigent. So that that's probably the, the form you're looking for. And that's, that's just the phrase that it's called. It means you don't have the means to pay to pay the fees for, for filing. And I will say when I send out the, the slides, I can include the packet and it's got a copy of that in it. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, yeah. All right, let's see. A custody order has been put in place in South Carolina where the uh, client used to live. They're, they're asking this question on behalf of someone else. They're a case manager. Um, so a custody agreement has been put in place in South Carolina where the client used to live. All parties have since moved here to North Carolina. How can we go about getting the custody agreement moved to North Carolina? South Carolina says they're no longer responsible since they live in North Carolina. And North Carolina says they can't do anything because the custody order is from out of state. So generally speaking for out of state orders um, where you have a case pending outside of North Carolina, there is procedure for getting the case moved to North Carolina. There are court forms for that. Um, it's a tricky process. It requires a lot of um, communication with the out of North Carolina jurisdiction to get documents moved to North Carolina. That's something that um, I would advise would need to have some sort of hand with, an, with a private attorney. Spencer, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, th there are ways and there, there are forms that you can fill out um, in North Carolina to register what's called a foreign order. That includes anything even just from a different state, even though, you know, we think of foreign as being something outside of the country. But when it, when it comes to custody, it's just anything outside of North Carolina. Um, and it, it requires it's not you communicating with both courts. It's actually the judge from North Carolina and the judge from the outside state have to pick up the phone and talk to one another and say, hey, the people don't live here anymore. Will you take this case off my hands? And then North Carolina's got to agree. Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, you're right. Nobody lives there anymore. So we'll take it. And um, so that's why it, it's kind of some stuff that happens behind the scenes that you, you have to fill out the right forms and make the request, but it's really on the judges in each in each state to talk to one another to the other state has to has to do what's called a release of jurisdiction before North Carolina can touch the case or make any type of modifications or determinations about the order. But the first step, if, if you just want to enforce it in North Carolina, um, you can register it and there's a North Carolina form for that. So you can go to, to nccourts.org. Um, and search for register foreign custody order. And there's, there's a pre-prepared state form that you can fill out and submit, um, probably with a certified copy of the order from out of state. Yes, you would need a certified copy of the order from out yeah. of state. And I believe there's just check boxes where you're saying, we're trying to register a foreign order for enforcement or registering mm -hmm. for modification purposes. So um, that I would seek out that form. 
Yeah, and that's kind of how the ball gets rolling for the courts to pick up the phone and talk about who's going to take the case. Okay. Um, is there any federal case law that defines precisely what is the best interest of the child doctrine? So this is a state matter. Um, so North Carolina would be looking to the North Carolina Supreme Court, North Carolina Court of Appeals. There, it's a multitude of factors that a judge is going to consider. Um, there is no formula, so to speak, of exactly what a judge must consider or must apply because it is very subjective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think typically what judges will look at is what's your living situation? Can you provide the child with a stable, safe living environment? Um, you know, is there any substance abuse going on in either household? Um, Physical you know, abuse, mental abuse. Right. It's so, so they're, they're looking at the totality of circumstances. It's not just, you know, it, it's not that there's one thing that that's the end all be all. Um, I will also say that there is North Carolina case law that says that there is no presumption that custody is better with mom versus with dad. Mm -hmm. So in North Carolina, y'all both start at 50-50. Or if you're adopted parents and you're same-sex parents, y'all start out at 50-50. So there's some states, I think maybe Virginia, maybe some other states, I've heard of there being still this, this presumption or this, this um, you start out kind of in favor of one party versus the other, but there is specific case law in North Carolina where that has been done away with. So you guys start on equal footing. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I want to file for full custody as my 16 year old has been with me for most of this year already. Uh, now that the, they've closed the court, I can't file for full custody. Can I still put the paperwork in? And is there anybody there that could help me fill the paperwork out? So you can definitely still send in the paperwork. Um, the clerks at the courthouse are not going to be able to help you fill out the documents, unfortunately. Um, they are not allowed to assist people with doing that. It's considered the unauthorized practice of law. Um, so they can't help you do that and they can't advise you how to do it. Um, but um, Gosh, Laura, can you think of any resources that would help fill out these types of documents? Um, I believe there are some, like a it, Carolina dispute resolution. Oh, there might be like yeah. some um, nonprofits that will charge, they still charge, um, to assist in drafting, but they don't represent you. They're not going to court with you. Mm -hmm. And typically, even if they do charge, it's, it's either a low flat fee or a sliding flat scale, scale fee. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not like, you know, a, a typical attorney's hourly rate that they're gonna charge you to, to help you with that kind of thing. Um, but no, unfortunately the clerk's office is not gonna be able to help, um, but you have a lot of time right now that between now and June the 1st, if you wanted to, to take your time and prepare those documents, um, you, you could do that between now and then. But it, even okay. though you can still file, but just nothing, no dates are gonna be set until then. All right, we've also got uh, our, our uh, the legal aid uh, website is having some technical difficulties right now, but we do have a video and packet, uh, as we've mentioned a couple of times that are up on there uh, that, that does do that. It walks you through how to file on your own. Um, this is a Facebook question, so they may have missed that part of the presentation. Okay. All right, let me scroll back up through this chat here. Do you have custody if you're the father and the mother passes away and you did not sign the birth certificate? That, Spencer, would you think filing for paternity? Would yeah. Be very... Yeah, now if, in, general, in general, because I don't know the specifics of your case, but in general for a father, for an unmarried father to have any rights to the child, you have to either be on the, the birth certificate or you have had to, you have to establish paternity first and a paternity action. So, um, you know, certainly if, if mom passed away and by default, you just kind of ended up with the child, that's not the same thing as legal custody. And it's, it's actually a kind of vulnerable situation because if you were to pass away, you know, what would happen to the child or, um, you know, if somebody needed to make legal decisions about that, you know, and without, 
without having established paternity, either through the birth certificate or a paternity case, um, there's, there's really no way for you to legally enforce those types of rights. And again, we had mentioned earlier, third parties could file for mm -hmm. custody like relatives. So keep that in mind too, just because you presume you are a biological parent to a child if you're not on the birth certificate and a child is with other family members or friends and caring for the child, you always are um, at risk for a third party lawsuit for custody. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. All right. Um, I have basically had sole custody of my children since two third, 2013. I set it up due to CPS requirements and he has not been complying with what was put in the paperwork. What can I do? So in general, um, you know, if you have a DSS parenting plan, that's not the same thing as a custody order. So um, I, I don't, if someone were to come with me with a question like that, I would probably refer them to DSS to say, hey, this person isn't following the parenting agreement or, you know, that the safety plan that's in place, what do we do? But now if, it, if you had a custody order and the other person's not following it, you would file a motion for contempt, but you have to have a custody order signed by a judge to be able to take advantage of that. Um, you can always, even though you have some type of arrangement with DSS, you can still have a, an actual custody case that results in an order from a judge. Um, it may not look exactly like your parenting plan or safety plan through DSS, so you'd have to make sure that you've done that sort of self-evaluation. Is it worth it for me to go through it? How might that change things? Is that gonna result in something different than what we have now? Um, but in general, you still can have a DSS case and a custody case. They're just, they're, they're not the same. And I think the custody case would trump the DSS case. Okay. Um, mother and I live together in Guilford County. This week, mother moved to Cumberland County with the baby who is nine months old and lived with both of us until yesterday. I plan to file for joint physical and legal custody. Do I file in Guilford County or in Cumberland County? Well, we addressed a slide earlier. Um, there's different places a person could file. So in general, you could, when a child is under six months, North Carol six months of age, um, North Carolina would have jurisdiction if a child has lived in North Carolina for the majority of his or her life. Um, venue, the, the county where a claim could be filed could either be in the place where the person who's filing the lawsuit lives or in the county where the other individual lives with the child. So it could be in either county. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't really, is it true that a corporate surety bond is required when a non-parent seeks guardianship of a minor whose parents are both deceased? I'm not quite sure that, yeah, is not something that I've ever dealt with in private practice. Yeah. I have, I have not heard of a corporate surety bond. Um, if I, if I, said that back correctly. I've not ever heard of one of those being required in a custody case. Um, organizations or agencies can sue for custody of a child. They're, they're one of the, the, you know, they're one of the entities that's allowed to sue for custody. Um, but I've never heard of, of a non-parent of any kind having to put up any type of bond in order to get involved in a custody action. Okay. Uh, I think this might be from the same person. Are there any fees for obtaining guardianship versus custody? We're talking about filing fees. I don't know. That's all the information I have. Well, there, there, unless you have submitted a petition to sue as an indigent, you're going to have filing fees. If you're not, um, the clerk doesn't grant you the, um, the ability not to have to pay. Yeah, and I think okay. it's important to think about what is it that you want out of guardianship versus what could you get with a custody case? Um, because a custody case and a custody order is in general going to give you a little bit more, a little bit more protection and a little bit more um, rights with the child versus just guardianship, I, at least you know, and, and guardianship can, can be its own. I mean, you, you can 
go through guardianship proceedings for adults too. So mm -hmm. it, that's a completely different process. None of none of this that's presentation has talked about any of the standards that are used in, in, in a guardianship proceeding. Mm -hmm. So that's something that um, you would need to seek out information specific to guardianship actions. But again, if we're talking about a minor child and you're thinking about guardianship versus custody, um, Custody is, custody is, I think, probably going to provide you with, with a little bit more um, legal authority to, to make decisions on behalf of the child and basically act as their parent, even if you're grandma or a third party. All right. And the next one here is about adoption, which is beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, I think this is related to service. Uh, what if they cannot get them at the address they stay at because they hide? Yeah, people like to do that sometimes. Um, the sheriff's office will make multiple attempts. Uh, I believe that with the first $30 fee, they will make two to three attempts at service. If they're unsuccessful, then you sometimes have to pay another fee. Um, the, the big thing to remember is that you yourself cannot serve the other party. Because if you are a party to the lawsuit, you can't serve the other side yourself. So even if law enforcement goes over there three, four times, you know they're just hiding, you can't go over there yourself and give them the papers. Um, and in North Carolina, you also cannot use a private process server in the state. Now, if you're starting a lawsuit, if you're starting a custody case in North Carolina for somebody that you know, the, the defendant lives in Tennessee, you can hire a private process server in Tennessee to serve the person in Tennessee. But if you're in the state, you have to either do certified mail or go through the sheriff's office. You can't do private process server in North Carolina. So um, if, if the sheriff's office can't get them at the address he originally gave, that's, you know, that's when I said, give them the address for where they work mm -hmm. to their mom's house to you know, anywhere you think that they hang out where, where they're gonna be able to get served. You could also, when um, you submit the documents to the sheriff's office for service, you could make note to let them know that the party works on certain days at certain times mm -hmm. or you think they might be home um, leaving for work around a certain time, uh, sort of just to help them out and give them maybe smaller windows of opportunity to, to find the defendant and serve them. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Can this be filed if there is currently a custody order in place? There was one put in place in 2016, and my son is now 14 and wants to live with me. So in general, if you already have a custody order, you have to file a motion to modify. So the, the forms that we spent a lot of time talking about um, in this presentation, you don't have to fill all those out, but you will need to know whether your order is temporary or permanent because um, that, that determines what you have to prove in order to get it changed. Either you're only having to say, hey, this, this change I'm asking for is in my child's best interest, or if your order is permanent, you're going to have to show that first, there's been a substantial change in circumstances that affect the welfare of the child. If the judge says, yeah, yeah, there's been this substantial change, then you have to prove that it's in the child's best interest to do what you're asking. So in, to do a motion to modify, you actually have to file um, a document called motion to modify telling the judge what's changed why this modification is now in the best interest of your child um, so it's a completely different process but it's still through the same custody case that you already have so you don't need to go file a whole new case just to modify the order you already have okay uh, you mentioned the civil calendar request do you request that even for the mediation session isn't that the first step before it goes to court if not resolved or agreed in mediation? Mediation is the first step before, um, before you have a, a formal hearing before a judge. Mediation is, I mean, it really would depend county to county, family court office to family court office. Generally speaking, um, mediation is set by the, the clerk or, or the family court office. Um, and that occurs before the notice of hearing that you might have been referring to would be um, when you have like an actual hearing date, like a temporary custody trial or permanent custody trial. Sometimes the party um, would be filling out that, that notice and requesting a date 
to be placed on the court calendar. Sometimes they're automatically assigned by the family court case coordinators. Um, so it's dependent based on what county, but mediation would be the first step. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, will this presentation be available to review online? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I was granted temp custody until court reopens in June. My husband who lives in New York wants me to send the boys up to New York to visit. Is this a recommendation? That's well, we can't make specific recommendations of any kind um, in this type of format. Um, but if you have a custody order, I would just say that um, in general, if you're not following the order, then you could be held in contempt. So, um, you know, if you're having if you're having specific questions about your case and, and, and you don't have an order in place, or I guess you said you do, um, that that's something that you need to consult with the private attorney about, because they're going to need to know what your order says mm -hmm. and how to advise you to act, and that's something that we can't we can't do in this setting. Okay, and. Is it possible to omit, to omit our address from the documents that are served to the other party? Him knowing our address is a risk to the children. I know in domestic violence cases, there is a way to omit your address um, and things get mailed to the, the state and then forwarded to you. For custody, isn't there a program through the attorney general's office? There is. I'm trying to look that up. There is. And that the the attorney general's office, the attorney general's office program is the one you're thinking of, Blaine, when we're when we're dealing with DV. Okay. I think that's probably the reason for the question. Let me see if I can uh, share my it's the address real confidentiality real program from the North Carolina yeah. Department of Justice. Yeah, that should be up on the screen there yeah. now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you're a victim of domestic violence, this should be a resource that's uh, available to you. Hopefully everyone can see that number, the 919-716-6785. Mm -hmm. It's worth reaching out. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Did uh, was there something else on that one? No, 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 that, that was the information I was looking for. The, the okay. only other thing I would say is that if you, if you have an address, um, maybe for a friend or a third party or someone that, that's willing to accept, um, to accept documents that's mailed there, then you can still put your name on the documents, but then on the line below for your address, you put C slash O. Um, so then that's, you know, the, then the documents would be being sent to the care of mm -hmm. this other address. So then that's box. another way to protect it. Do what? A PO box. Right. Yeah. Or you could have a PO box. Sometimes you have to pay for PO boxes though. Um, so yeah, if you've got a friend who's, who's going to let you use their address, that's one thing that you could also do. Just have things sent there. All righty. Um, how to show I'm a fit parent, even though I have mental illness. So mental illness doesn't automatically make someone unfit. Um, I always, say it's more than just like a diagnosis. It's how you're treating it. If you're following recommendations of your doctor, um, taking medications as prescribed, going to therapy, um, that's something to keep in mind. It's not just an automatic uh, negative. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think as long as, um, like in, in general, if somebody is following the recommendations of their doctor, taking medicine as prescribed, not, not leaving pill bottles or things out in places where children can get them. Um, and as long as it's not a, a, type of, um, a type of condition that affects the children in any negative way, um, then in general, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be you know, an end all be all, that's, that's the determining factor in your case. Okay. Um, father of a child signed the birth certificate without establishing paternity, but now questions paternity. Father is being threatened by mother that he will never see the child. What are his next steps? Well, not speaking to the paternity issue since that's beyond the scope. Generally, um, if you have not filed a lawsuit for custody in the past um, and you meet the 
standing requirements to file a lawsuit, you can use the information that we discussed in today's PowerPoints about starting an initial custody complaint against um, a, an opposing party, another parent. Yeah, and, and I would say that in general, if you're already on the birth certificate, then um, then you can go ahead and file. Um, and if in general, if in in a case like that, if the other party wanted to contest paternity, they they would have to there would probably have to be a paternity action. Um, so again, like Laura said, it's outside the scope. Um, but typically, when someone's when a father's name is on the birth certificate, mm -hmm. um, they're treated as the father in a custody case basically until proven otherwise. Yep. All right, and I think this might be our last question. Uh, can a case be transferred from one county to another? And does the petition have to be filed in the residence of the child or the court the case was filed in? I don't quite get that last bit. So um, yes, cases can be moved from one county to another. Um, that would be called a motion to transfer venue. And um, if the parties agreed about it, that'd be really nice and easy. Uh, but if you were trying to transfer venue away from where the defendant lives into the county where you live, be prepared for a little bit of a fight because that's gonna be inconvenient for them and they don't have to agree. Um, so you might have to have a court hearing and, and then the judge, you know, tell the judge why, you know, you think it's best that it be moved. And then the judge could, could order that it's moved. Um, the petition, I, I'm just going to interpret that as does a motion to transfer the case to a different county have to be filed in the new one or the old one? It has to be filed in the old one. The original. Because so, the judge in the original one has to say, yeah, you know what, you're right. That's better if we move it. So it has to, that has, to, the motion has to be filed in the original county. Okay. Let me just check and make sure I'm not missing anything. All right, I think that's everything that I've got here. So thank you all for coming. I hope you found this presentation helpful. The video will be available on our Facebook page. If you signed up through Eventbrite and we've got your email address, keep an eye out for that email with uh, the, the video, the packet, the, the PowerPoint slides, all of that, that'll go out um, at this point probably tomorrow. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all very much and good luck. Bye.